There we go. And without further ado, allow me to hand over to Pallavi Dean. Pallavi, thank you for joining us for this talk. Over to you. Thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction. Wise words, my God, that, that's a tall order, but I am going to try my very best, I promise you. Um, so yeah, let's get started. What is this topic about? Don't be a starving artist. I mean, I love this cute little monster. He likes to eat, you know, and he likes to be creative as well. So can we find a way, can we find a happy balance between these two? And that's what this talk is really about. So let me start with a little bit of history for those of you that don't know me. Um, you know, when I first started off my career, people said to me, listen, only one in 10 creative directors are female. Just get out of architecture when you can. This is a terrible idea. And then, you know, they said to me, listen, you're a brown woman in construction. Can you, can you just back away right now? And I remember reading this amazing book by Cal Newport, and this has stuck with me throughout my career, right? And I made this my mantra, be so good that they can't ignore you. And if there's one thing you take away from this talk today, it's this, everything else is subjective, but your expertise, your knowledge, that is not subjective, that's hardcore. So I kept this in my mind when I started off. So what's my first kind of tip to you guys? The first thing is building your personal brand. Each one of us, whether you're a creative, whether you're a journalist, whether you're in PR, whatever your field is, we are all some sort of a creative, right? We have to focus on building our own personal brand. Now, some people might think, oh my God, this is so narcissist. This is so self-obsessed. We can't be seen talking about ourselves. Not true. If you don't toot your own horn, no one else's. But there's a way of doing it, right? So when I started my career, I didn't focus on, hey guys, look at the clothes I'm wearing, look at my shoes, look at my bag. No, I'm an architect, I'm a designer. I always focused on my expertise, right? It was never, I never went to these, you know, I think some of you, if you're designers, you'll recognize these names, right? They're known names. I didn't just focus on the low hanging fruit, right? Let me go to Kalish Times, nothing wrong with Kalish Times, I'm a big fan, right? But I didn't just say, let me go to Kalish Times and get a four page spread. It wasn't about that. It was about, first of all, doing awesome work, because unless you don't do awesome work, no one's interested in writing about you. But instead of me going to them and saying, hey, I've got this brilliant project, can you publish it? I went to them and said, you know what, I've written this thought paper on the psychology of design, I'd love to share that content with you. Just remember, journalists are hungry for content. And that's how you build a relationship with them. So number one, do good work. Number two is create content and make sure it's not vacuous and self-obsessed, right? So we've also been published in a number of books. Can I ask you guys, if you don't mind, can you just mute yourselves? Because I'm like a goldfish. I get distracted very easily. Um, Anyways, so coming back to this, right? So you kind of have to target media in your industry, which you see is the benchmark. Number two, also getting third party endorsement might not be easy, but it is so important. And that comes through creating quality content and which is why we got into all these books. And then listen, mainstream media, I'm a huge fan, okay? Because we can't all just chase the highbrow FT and the wallpaper. All of those are good to have, but everybody loves mainstream media. And, you know, I, I lied to you a little bit earlier when I said, you know, I'm not going to show you what I'm wearing, but sometimes I do talk about fashion as well. But that's important because all of this, these are like little um, kind of little threads that make a beautiful couture dress, which is your brand, which is so important. You know, in our industry, we get a lot of flack for chasing awards. I've never seen, and I've never understood why. Look, I've never um, anchored my work or my self-worth on an award, but they're great marketing tools. They take a lot of time, you know, to kind of, I'll just remind you guys one more time. If you don't mind muting, that would be awesome. Um, so, you know, like awards are brilliant because they're a great marketing tool. There are a lot of effort, obviously, to enter these, but it is important. And when you're entering award, please don't enter those pay for win awards because those most people who are in the industry or most people who understand how things work will know which are the pay for win awards and which are actually legitimate with an independent jury. So if you're an artist, if you're a designer, again, find what those platforms are in your industry and go after them and really go after them. It took us like five years of trying to get into some of this. This is just a little short video 
of why personal brand is important, right? Two years ago, uh, no, wait, we're in 2022, sorry, three years ago, I was approached by, you know, one of uh, at least leading lighting brand called Artemide. And they said to me, hey, can you design a light fitting for us? And you have to remember, I grew up in Dubai, right? We've always kind of imported good design, the best in class from London, the best in class from New York, Singapore, wherever it is. People never came to us and said, hey, you've got talent. Can you export something out here? So I was like, wow, those eight years of building the brand, of consistently kind of talking about what's happening in this region, talking about what we were doing in this region, eventually resulted in this which is fabulous. You know, first of all, it's a kind of a good pat on the shoulder. The international community is watching us. But you know what? Whenever they sell this piece of lighting, I get, I get some money out of it, which is great. You know, like I said, you can't just focus on, if you're just a designer, if you just focus on interior design or just on architecture, you're thinking with your visors on and we have to get out of this. We have to think about what are the other avenues we can explore to generate income. So for me, a lot of stuff that I do is I do a lot of content creation, which generates income for the business, but even productizing some of my work is helping me generate additional income. So think about that in your personal circumstances. What are the parallels to your expertise that you can capitalize on? Very important. Now, you know, this is one of my favorite words, you know, hustle. I know it's like, it's got some bad press lately. People are like, oh, what is that? You know, like I'm a professional, I'm an expert, I'm not a hustler. But can I just tell you, 90% of what I do on a daily basis is hustling. So I don't know how many, I can't see your faces, which is such a shame with this whole digital thing, because I can't get any energy back from you guys. But, you know, I love this section in a fashion magazine, you know, where they say, get the look. So this is Chanel. How can you make high street look like Chanel? And I remember seeing this when I was young and I was like, wow, wouldn't that be awesome? So everybody wants Minotti and they want the Rolls Royce of interior design, but their budget is kind of, you know, Mazda level. So how do you make that happen for people? And that's where the hustling comes in. What do I mean by that? So, you know, quite often I'm very blessed that I'll get an amazing government client or some awesome person from Saudi who'll say to me, you know, Pallavi, you have carte blanche, you have 80 million riyals, go do what you want. And most of the times I just fall off my chair and I'm like, are you kidding me? I've just had a heart attack. Most of the times I get a client who will come to me and say, hey, listen, I want a Rolls Royce, but I've got a master budget. I don't just sit there and say, I'm not going to touch your project. I think, oh, wow, this is an opportunity. How can I be creative? And in some cases, that means, you know, fabricating joinery locally. In some cases, that means going down to CB2 or Marina Home and finding pieces so it's about blending, you know, high street. So I've got a beautiful floss light in here, but I've got a couple of pieces from elsewhere. So it's blending high street with high fashion and high end and giving the client a final result. I'll give you another example. This was our studio way back, I don't know, six years ago. But you see that cork board wall and everyone who came to our office were like, oh my God, your inspiration wall is so cute. And it was like 300 dirhams from Amazon. So you have to kind of get out of this mentality where, you know, you can only specify from our key products and you can only use designer brands. I'm a big fan of designer brands. These are Vitra chairs and I'll never compromise on that. But I'll always think of ways of blending high street with high end. So I would advise that you start thinking of these kind of strategies when you're working as well. Uh, another very very quick example. This was a not-for-profit um, uh, entrepreneurship center that we designed years ago. And, you know, typically when you go into a seminar room, you get a whole series of white chairs because that's what the budget was. You could get a whole series of white chairs, but just a quick kind of color fix made it look like it was a designed space. And I think we have to start thinking a little bit. Guys, do you mind just muting yourself, please, if you've just joined? Thank you so much. Um, so thinking about these kind of tips and tricks, right? Adding a pop of color to the ceiling. It's a very easy hack. So I think, think about these parallels also in stuff that you're doing. I'm assuming most of you are creatives. That's why you're interested in this talk. So think about quick hacks that can help you. Another very important thing. I don't know if some of you might know me. I am a little bit of a geek. I am a little bit of a nerd. You know, I am an academic at heart. I love studying. I love teaching. This is a big part of it. Let me just demonstrate to you through these next few slides why that ivory tower thinking is so important. First of all, it kind of helps you have an intelligent conversation with most people in the field, right? 
going back to my first slide, you know, be so good they can't ignore you. If you really are an expert in your field, it's very hard for people to kind of, you know, uh, try and push you out of projects or push you out of RFP. So first, let's really hone that in. And academia is a huge part of it. I'll give you a couple of kind of concepts that I've taken from theory and then applied into practice. And, you know, like uh, six years ago, I did my master's in design theory. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to use this in practice. This is so boring. But you know, I studied about this concept called fractal geometry. Fractal geometry is fascinating, right? You have similar details that occur at different magnitudes of scale. So you see a tree, but then when you zoom in on the branch of the tree, it looks exactly like the tree. Super fascinating, right? You look at a landscape, but then again, when you zoom into a particular hedge, you'll see those same lines. This is a beautiful, you know, I'm sure some of you might have been to Cambodia. You see that beautiful skyline. Again, when you zoom in, there are those little kind of details that are replicated within that skyline. And I was just fascinated when I learned about this. And I was like, okay, how can I bring this into my work? So it's not just about learning about theory, but it's also about application and bringing it into. So, you know, we've done it in various ways. We've done it in reception desk designs, in screens. We've done it within manifestation details, which are just the stickers that you put on the glass, right? So when you study or when you read a good book, please make a note and please think, and don't just suddenly be like, oh, that was great content. You know, let me, let me repost this in a tweet. No, relate it back to what you do every day and see how you can use it. I'll give you a couple of other quick examples, right? Something super interesting that I learned in, again, design uh, in my master's of design theory is simulated versus illusory. So, you know, when you look at this, I, I think most of you will see a snake. If you're paying attention, if you've already fallen asleep, I don't know, I can't help you. But, you know, that could also be a hose pipe. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So sometimes if you're in a garden and you see a hose pipe, you know, some of us might get startled straight away. I think, oh, I, I just stepped on a snake. So how can you take a concept like that into design? And it's quite simple. You know, you see it in wellness centers. You see it in hospitals all over. When you don't have a natural light or you don't have a view to a room, just doing something with the ceiling, that simulated or that illusory effect can have exactly the same effect on you. Now, when we talk about wellness, when we talk about, you know, feeling good or increasing productivity within the space, all of these academic theories, they're not ivory tower, they're very much practice. This is our own, our own studio six years ago. And, you know, biophilia was another concept that I was just... I was just taken up with, you know, it's the human desire, the human need to be connected with nature. I can't put a real olive tree in an indoor space, but I could get a beautiful petrified branch of the tree and have a preserved olive tree within my studio and have those feelings of wellness, have those feelings of biophilia. You know, here you see a moss wall. So think about how you can translate these concepts because that's quite important. I don't know how many of you, again, this is not an interactive session, so I can't even see what you're doing right now. But if you've driven past Dubai Festival City, you know, you'll see this beautiful kind of skin and the entire skin on the parking lot moves every time there's a movement of the wind. And that was quite simply kind of, you know, taken from the scales of a fish. So think about abstract concepts, stylized concepts that you can relate. How does this connect to being profitable? Every client that I have met, you know, my, my, my first brief will be, yes, I want you know, the Mazda for the Rolls Royce, you know, that's my first brief. The second brief, I want something nobody else has. So if you're thinking about charging big bucks, and if you're thinking about really giving your clients something that nobody else has done before, innovation's a bit overrated, you know, everything's been done. But if you're really thinking of putting a new spin on it and being able to charge the kind of fees you want to charge, then you really have to invest in that research, in that theory, and then bring it to practice. It's quite important, right? Just try my slides a bit stuck. Okay, here we go. I'm a big kind of fan of psychology, right? And I think it kind of influences all our work. And I think it really should influence everyone's work because human interaction, we, we all interact with humans every single day, right? Whether we like it or not. Some of us are hermits and homebodies, but we still have to deal with some humans. Psychology and empathy have always been ingrained in my work. Now, going back to why does that allow us to charge the fees that we do? We have a proprietary process at Roll, and it's taken me years to develop it. I have had help from, you know, the best in class of 
psychotherapists, psychologists, work behavioral analysts, right? And we've come up with our own deep customer empathy system where we go from like the broader goal to the narrow goal. But what that simply is, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, I'm just making it sound really fancy. I mean, it is fancy when the experts do it and it allows me to charge the big bucks. But what it really is, is just getting to know your client, okay? What many designers or many creatives do is they have a preconceived notion of what the other person wants. And this is very often disconnected from what the person actually wants. Sometimes my client will tell me, I know exactly what I want, but even they don't know what they want, right? If they don't know what they want, how the heck am I supposed to know what they want? So I think the first step before you hit pen to paper, please just take a step back. Calm your design ego. It's not about your signature style. It's not about you making a stamp in the creative world. It's about understanding your client. Why does this help? 90% of my business is repeat business or referrals. And there've been like scientific studies done on the cost of recruiting a new client versus keeping an existing client happy. The cost of recruiting a new client is much higher. So what I would say, once you really understand your customer, your client, you really won't mess up. There won't be any abortive work. This becomes like your holy grail that you come back to at any point in the project. And it's a scientific process. So it's very hard to kind of, you know, again, it's not subjective. It is objective. When somebody tells me, I want open plan office, I'd be like, yeah, actually, but your company structure is quite siloed. I don't think that's going to work. You know, so it avoids a lot of back and forth. If you just invest in this upfront and it's going to give you sort of like huge benefits. I, I think what's really important is you want to be sorry before my dear friend Marcel jumps into this I just want you to listen to what he says here okay because I couldn't have said it better so I put a short clip from him a great uh, designer is you, you give something to the world which only you can give so you give your culture you give your ideas and so to be truly honest to what you believe and to really follow that that is, I think, what, uh, what, what I, I, I can only hope that designers do, because then they will bring something to the world which only they can do. So I thought that was like quite, quite nice of Marcel to share that with all of us, right? Because you can think about, yes, psychology is very evidence-based. It's very scientific. But don't forget, you are that human component in this equation. Because if you step aside from your ego or your kind of, you know, your own design sensibility and bring that uniqueness to your process, that's what, what is going to consistently set your projects aside from anybody else's. I think we've heard this over and over again, but you almost can't undervalue it, right? Be a storyteller. Now, you know, this is like an advertising, marketing sort of, you know, gimmicky term, but why is it important? Think back to kind of cavemen, right? This is a part of our evolution. It's a part of our genetics almost, right? We'd sit around a campfire and we'd share stories. Stories actually evoke a very emotional response in all of us. You think about a little child. How does a child learn about morals? He learns about, or he or she learns about morals through storytelling. And that's why we, we have been ingrained with this culture of storytelling. So if I go to the client and I say, hey, Mr. Client, you know, here's a fabulous design, let's sign off. Yeah, he might think it's a fabulous design, but if I go to him and I say, hey, Mr. Client, here's a fabulous design, and it's based on the context. And, you know, it's about a Bedouin who walked through the deserts, and it's his journey and all the travel kit that he had, and that's translated into the furniture and blah, 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 right? It is our job as creatives to really evoke that emotional response. Because once you, you know, most of us, we're irrational, unpredictable, all humans are. But if you get them at that emotional level, you know, and that's really important for a client to have that emotional connection, not just with you as a human, but also with the work that you're presenting, that'll really get them thinking. I'll give you a quick little example of what we did. So about uh, four years ago, we rebranded to Roar. We were called Palavidin Interiors. I know, so self-obsessed, so narcissist, but I was a freelancer. Don't forget, guys, I was working on my guest bedroom. That's my defense. And, you know, when all these other talented designers started joining me, I, I wasn't comfortable with having my name on the door. So I couldn't really afford, like, you know, the, the brash brands of the world. So we came up with the branding ourselves. And then in the months that led up to the big reveal of the new 
name. You know, we spent some time just creating like these little teasers, but they were telling a story. They were telling about, they, they were talking to this idea of what the name was. My class, my class. Can you tell me? Uh, my class. Okay, there we go, we're muted. Thank you for that interaction. At least I know someone's there. Okay, so, you know, we were talking about, you know, how we can connect that name, Roar, to designers, you know, whether it was a creme de la creme of design talents or caging designers, we built this whole campaign around it. Another example that I can give you, you know, again, going back to uh, Shira, which is a not-for-profit um, entrepreneurship center that we worked on. It was really interesting when we were pitching for this project, we didn't just go and be like, hey, here's some visuals. This is what your new space is gonna be like. We created a little comic strip and that comic strip was the journey of a typical entrepreneur at day one, what do they do? One month later, through the incubation, what do they do within the space on a daily basis? And we actually went through the effort of finding out who the clients were. We found what they looked like and we actually drew them into the comic strip, right? So you can imagine the client is choosing from, you know, Dubai has no shortage of very talented designers. What is going to set you apart? And you have to always think about that. What is your special USP? When the client sees a comic strip, you've clearly researched them. You care about the journey of the person who's walking through the space. And you've gone through that extra mile trouble of actually finding their faces and make, making them look slimmer, because that also helps you know, sometimes, and making them look good within that space. That creates that emotional response, that storytelling that you need. So you cannot ever discount storytelling when you're selling or pitching your work. It applies for both, not just the pitch. You won the pitch, great, got the job. But then you have to actually sell your idea to them, right? Because that's what they're paying you for. So try and bring those elements in. And then this was kind of the finished product. This is Shira, Shira 2, we're now working on Shira 3. But that's super important, right? Getting, getting repeat clients. And I think I told you this before, I really pride our business on bringing people back. Now, I'm not gonna take questions at this time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push on through, but I'm gonna give you loads of times for interaction and questions right at the end. I, I'm guessing this is why most of you are here, right? Because how do you price if you are just starting out, if you are you know, an SME, if you're a large organization, how do you price? How do you, figure, how do you get your head around that? Because you don't want to be that starving artist I showed you in the first page. Actually, my monster was eating jam and peanut butter, so he's fine. So you guys don't want to be the starving artist. So I'll give you a funny story. Ignore the slide, because a designer would never do a slide that looked like this, right? I'm... Um, currently doing my MBA because I didn't think I had enough on my plate. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go back to school again. It's important. And in my first class of marketing, you know, they started talking to me about market segmentation and pricing. And I was like, oh my God, th th there's a science behind this. I've just been doing finger in the air when I started, you know, I, I can't believe people do this. People do things like, and this is why I'm sharing this with you because I didn't know this before I started my MBA. Please put together a positioning statement understand who your audience is. I still have a multidisciplinary practice, you know, because I'm, I'm just a greedy person. So I go after every sector. I go after commercial, residential, hospitality, retail, architecture, basically anything that I think is creative and fun, I will go after it. But what I learned or am learning in my MBA, that is a terrible business strategy. You should really focus. You should think, okay, I want to go after the education sector. I want to go after the commercial sector and go after it really strong. If that's the business you want to build, I'm building my business so I can have fun every day. I mean, honestly, that's why I do what I do. But if I can give you one piece of advice when you're starting out, if you're still looking at your business, please try and segment your audience because it really works. And that's what's really, then what's really interesting is when I was doing my MBA or I'm doing my MBA, people started showing me all these slides about pricing bundles and how they should break down. And I turned around to them and I said, listen, that's all good when you have a product, but you know, I've been doing this for eight years with a service, it's completely different. And that's the key. We are selling an intangible asset, right? Because when you're selling a sofa, it's really easy. The sofa is like $75,000, take it or leave it or walk out of my store. But when you're selling an intangible asset, it's a much harder sale which is why I'm telling you, put your processes in place. You've got your psychology element, you've got your storytelling element, you've got a proven track record of su uh, success, third-party endorsement, 
all of those are tangible because people can Google and they can see and they can touch and feel, you know, like a report on psychology, you can touch and feel that it is tangible. So this kind of started giving me an idea, but I'm just going to share with you what we typically do right now, which, which, which is a straightforward work. It's, we haven't run into loss yet. So I think, I think it's a good solid method of doing it, right? Break down your staff and their hourly rate. And this is not rocket science. Some of you are like, why is she, you know, drilling down on stuff like this? But to some of you, maybe this is very new information. Think about what your salary is <coughs> for each of those members. What is kind of, you know, what is their overhead, which is health insurance, your rent, your PI insurance, your professional indemnity, all of that kind of stuff. And then work out resource allocation. So you know what the hourly rate is. You know approximately how many hours this person is going to spend on the project and then you get a total fee. And now this is a good way to do it because you're not only accounting for resource, but you're also accounting for time, which is really important because you know the creative process is not linear. The creative process is iterative and it's very circular and you jump out of that circle and then you come back. Sometimes it becomes an infinity loop. Sometimes it just ends up in sleepless nights. You've got to, put, you've got to count for all those hours. I would really strongly advise you to do that. And it's really interesting, like, look at this boring slide. You know, this is not my vibe at all, but I have someone in place doing this. And that's important. We sometimes, when I started off and I run this business by myself, really for the first four years, it was a silly thing to do because I was not an HR consultant. I was not equipped to do fee proposals or I was even my own accountant. And maybe at startup, you kind of have to do that. But as soon as you can, please get someone who understands numbers and who can structure this to do it for you. Because once you start putting weekly timesheets, you know, you understand where you're spending your time and how you can maximize that time. And going back to making your intangible service tangible, you've got to break it down. And that's what we do. We talk about the briefing period. We talk about what is inside the briefing period. We talk about sort of the pre-concept, then we do a concept, then we do a scheme, then we do a DD. But we list down every single deliverable because this is what makes it really sort of tangible for the client. So it's really important to do this. So my advice, if you're starting out, just use this. This is, you will not go wrong with this. If it's hours versus kind of your, hour, you know, your daily or an hourly date for the total number of hours, and then start getting into doing weekly timesheets and really breaking down your deliverables because this will give you great benchmarks that you can compare against. So now, you know, when I go to my managing director or my, uh, my CFO and I'll say, hey guys, found this amazing retail project. It's so cute. I really want to do it. They both just roll their eyes at me. They're like, we're not doing it. And here's why. Of course, I get final veto. If I really love the client, or if I really, you know, love the project, I will still do it. But they have hard facts to throw at me. They'll be like, this is how much of your time this is going to take up. This is not profitable for the business. And if you're doing that, that's opportunity cost. What are you not doing? Are you not spending time with your kids? And that comes into the conversation as well. Are you not spending time with your kids? Are you not doing your MBA? Are you not doing actual work that the other paying clients are paying us for? So you have to have these honest conversations. Don't go after everything that's shiny and sparkly. And if you figure out how not to do that, please tell me because I really struggle. Um, but you know, it's really important that you think sensibly. Now, finally, I really... <laughs> I, oh, yes. I don't know what that was, but um, that was entertaining. Okay. Now, finally, I really love this image, right? It's this, I don't know, it's like a llama horse, but it's trying to be a unicorn. Don't do that. Okay. If, if again, you know, if my, my big mantra for 2020 was like, you do you, and it served me so well over the last two years, because kind of helps you block out the noise sometimes. And I love this Brené Brown quote. I'm going to give you like 10 seconds to read it yourself. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, right? So I won't say that word. But you know, very often people have opinions about your work, about your project, about how you deal with clients. But honestly, that's just noise. If they're not doing exactly the same hustle that I'm doing, and it's very uncommon that two people will have the same hustle, 
I'm just, I'm really not interested in your feedback. So don't try and get down. And I'll give you, I'll tell you why this is important. As creatives, we're very sensitive people. You know, we put ourselves into the work and then we put our work out there, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's for people to walk into. And people are real, you know, that word there, you know? And they, they, they can be really brutal for no reason, never achieved anything in their life, but they have an opinion. I'll give you a personal example, right? So I was in Dharavi, which is India's, Asia's actually, Asia's largest slum. And I was taken away. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like they actually had a pottery industry in there and they were doing recycled plastics. And I was like, this is amazing. What can I take from here for my new furniture line that I was working on? And you know, what happens first thing on Instagram? Oh, it's grossly inappropriate. Look at her sunglasses. Look at the clothes she's wearing in Dharavi. And I was like, really? Like, that's what you took away from that? I took away the pottery industry. I took away the recycled plastics, which have been used in my new product. But you're taking away the fact that I'm romanticizing in a slum. You know, people are going to talk. But, you know, whenever I hear all this chatter, either it's from competitors or from people whose opinion I really don't care about, I always I think you heard the music. Did you? Can somebody just put their mic on and say if they heard the music or not? Yes, I we heard it. it for me. Oh, we did. Yeah. God. God, that's my favorite song. But you know, this is this is kind of I channel Taylor Swift, right? When I hear all this negativity around me, I'm like, you know what? I'm waking up every morning. I'm doing the best I can do. And I'm doing it as me because I will only always be me. I'm not for everyone. I'm Marmite, right? I'm not, I wish I was like peanut butter and jelly, jelly peanut butter and jelly. I can't even say it because it's so boring, but I'm not. I'm Marmite and I'm going to embrace it. But just be your authentic self, block out that noise and focus on your craft. Because at the end of the day, that's some, what- oops, somebody oh. that I don't Sorry, Taylor wants to keep going, but I'm going to try and skip that. Okay, good. So just be your authentic self. You do you. One thing that's super personal to me, and you know, I've I've uh, I've had a great I've kind of had a great life. I'm having a great life, right? But I wasn't born into money. I'm not a trust fund kid. I didn't even marry rich. I mean, like yeah, whatever. But giving back is super super important to me. And the one thing that's very precious to me is my time. So money I can give back. I will support people whenever I can. But the one way I give back, and you have to find an authentic way to give back, because don't just expect people to give you stuff, awards and press and projects and love and all of that kind of stuff. If you're not willing to give back, one way I give back is to students. Like I really make sure that I spend time with the next generation of designers, whether it's teaching, whether it's doing talks in this format, not just locally, I do this for universities in Pakistan and India, and this is my passion. So find your passion. Your passion could be raising money for a charity and running, and that could be your way of giving back. Now I'm not trying to make a, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to raise funds here, but you know, find your way of giving back and do it. This is the last slide I'm gonna leave you with. Thank you for paying attention, but I love this. I found this on Pinterest of all the places and it really describes the creative process, at least for me, you know? Client comes in, it's a client I've always wanted. It's a project I've always wanted. And I'll start with, yay, this is awesome. You know, we get into concept design and the client's giving me comments, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, this is a bit tricky. Then I get to the face and I'm like, okay, downright, this is crap, right? After I get to that phase, I start doubting myself and I'll be like, oh my God, I really suck. And then as a you know, project goes to side of your painting, your painting's nearly realized, you think, oh, this might be okay. And then finally, when you hand over to your client, you actually believe in yourself and you think, this is awesome. And this is why I do what I do every day. So with that, I will open the floor to questions from you. Wow, that was amazing. Um, you are the Oprah Winfrey of the UAE, I tell you. You give us so much inspiration. And, and yes, there is a lot of times where we don't believe in ourselves, where we've had a really bad week uh, and we're heading down and we need to always believe in ourselves. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure everybody's got lots of questions, but I know no one wants to be the first to ask. So I'll, I'll kick off. Um, not really question. Well, I've got one question, but I want to highlight a few things. You talked about hustling. Yeah. I, my mantra is stalking. 
yours is slightly more polite. Stalk with charm, hustle with charm. But if, and if you don't demonstrate your research, like you, you said, if you don't do your research into a client, make sure you understand every detail about what that person, what that client, what that company is, because as you say, it will pay di dividends. I think too many of us don't listen. We want to push ourselves, push our own agenda, our own vision. The moment we meet a client after five minutes, no, the most refreshing thing a client wants, be it a company, be it an individual, is to, for you to ask them questions, uh, for them to tell them more, tell you more about themselves. Um, everything you said was ringing true, things that I'd forgotten. But I want to ask you one thing. If you knew what you know now, would you be where you are today? If I knew what I knew, no way, gosh, no way. Life is a journey. And I think, you know, every little bump along the way or every little kind of throwaway pushes you in a different direction. No, I'd be a completely different person. So I'm grateful for my journey. And I, I think also it's that, it's that period of our lives when we are not filled with preconceived ideas that is the free we feel the freest and the most confident we ever feel mm -hmm. as we get older more experienced more knowledgeable of course there are lots of advantages but we are piled up with preconceived ideas and that can often throttle us suffocate us i, I went to drama school many years ago and my drama teacher told me the first one said whatever you do never become cynical because the moment you become in, uh, a, a absorbed with cynicism, you lose that freedom to create uh, and to express yourself with honesty. So I think that's very important that sometimes we just believe in what we are and where we've come from as well. Uh, Samar asks, thanks for the amazing presentation, how to put a number for your service? To what do you compare it to? Yeah, that's a good question, Summer, because we don't have open databases here where you can compare. What I've been doing over the last eight years is whenever I pitch for a competitive uh, request for proposal, if we don't succeed or even if we succeed, I will always ask the project manager or the client where the other fees were sitting at. And if you want to know how to price your service, that's what I was talking about earlier. Just think about the hours that you spend and think about your hourly rate. And that's a good way to kind of benchmark and start. Don't base it on construction costs, base it on your time. Very good point. And I think throughout your whole talk, Pallavi, you're talking common sense. Yes, the MBA, uh, you know, institutions have turned it into a science and rightly so. There is a science behind it. But at the end of the day, it boils down to common sense, doesn't it? I know. But Lisa, common sense is not so common. You know, like I said, I've been doing it for like eight years intuitively. And it took me this MBA to kind of stop and question what I was doing. And OK, yes, it was a, it's been a successful business. But what if I'd run it to the ground in the first three years? So I will never discount having someone remind you of that common sense, whether it's reading a book, doing a degree. I mean, sometimes you just need to read a book. You don't need to go and suffer like I am with five exams a month. You know, you can just read a book and you can get what you want out of it. Um, but yeah, I think common sense is not that common, is what I would say. I'm guilty. Hey. <laughs> not at all. Any, any questions from anybody else? Oh, oh, hold on, Eileen. The wonderful Eileen Wallace is, is keying in here. Hi, Pallavi, amazing insights. Is all PR good PR in your experience? Oh my God, how can I answer Eileen? Like she's a PR guru. That would just be ridiculous for me to say anything. Um, okay, Eileen, I don't think all PR is good PR. No, I really think the way we've done it is we've really targeted the PR and the publications that we've wanted. So I always prefer the targeted approach. And maybe when I first started out, I thought all PR was good PR. But now as I've matured, both as an individual and as a company, maybe I don't need all that exposure. So now I kind of pick and choose. And also before I was doing it all myself, where we actually have a PR agency, on board now who's helping me curate and I think what was it I think the other day um you know the son in the UK asked me for an interview and I was like the son I'm gonna do it and my PR agency's like no you do the son the FD is never gonna touch you and I'm like 
Oh, okay. So I leave good question, but no, you know the answer to that already. Brilliant. Okay, uh, Dua Ahmed has uh, put something on chat. Um, I have a question that goes back to your slide about creating a brand and getting your work out to the world. I wanted to know if you try to put your work out, but it doesn't go through, would it be a good idea to reassess the work or keep looking for someone who could get it out? And if so, when should you know when to stop? Yeah, look, Dua, it took me five years to get onto Dazeen, but I was focused. I wanted to get on Dazeen. I wanted to get my work focused, you know, published rather on Dazeen and on Frame. I got a lot of rejection. Like my work, actually, quite honestly, my work wasn't good enough, you know? And if you're getting a rejection, you have to understand why. It's not like, you know, five magazines can't be wrong. Your aesthetic might not marry with where the international trends on design are currently, right? Your aesthetic may not be for a global audience, but there will be a local audience somewhere where that aesthetic is spot on. So also understand why that is getting rejected. But like I said, don't start with that place from, what can I get out of you? I started by doing talks for design, judging for design, creating content for design, and eventually they're like, oh, okay, let's have a look at your work. Then they, they probably just trashed my work before then. And then when they looked at it, they were like, oh, actually it's not so bad. Maybe we'll give her a couple of features. So I think it's a combination. Absolutely, and also to add to that, um, I, I've, been, I'm a, I've been a magazine editor for several art magazines in the region. And I tell you this, first of all, it's down to luck. Will it make, will it reach the inbox? Uh, am I not overwhelmed enough to look at new content? Uh, and are you feeding it to me in the right way? That's the first, then, then you get your foot in the door and then build that relationship. And the number of times I will build a relationship with people who pick up the phone and speak to me rather than either sending a representative or just pursuing me by email i'm a human you're a human let's talk like you say in your presentation and I think that's a really good point it's about how do you make that information digestible people just write blurb and shit and they don't put like images on there we're in a visual field grab the person you've got three seconds of person's you know attention how can you grab them and get them super quick i'm reading some of the questions that come in Sefala, that's a really good question how do you navigate as an introvert now you're not going to believe this but I, I was an introvert, okay? So for the first kind of five years of when I launched my business, I, I just didn't want to meet. I'm still a bit like that. I'm still a bit of a homebody. I hate going out. I hate meeting people. It's not my vibe at all. But get an extrovert to do it for you. You don't have to be good at everything. My husband is a complete opposite of me. And he's an extrovert. He's a, he loves socializing. He loves meeting people. And when I was launching my business, I needed him. He was my little crutch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Um, so, you know, align yourself with an extrovert to begin with, but then, you know, slowly, I think he's created a monster because now I'm like, let's go out, let's do stuff. And he's like, who are you? And where's the woman I married 18 years ago? But align yourself with an extrovert. That's my response to you. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, which one should we go for next? Um, there is, uh, Majda is asking about pricing strategy specifically for visual artists. Um, obviously, Pallavi, I'm sure you've got your own opinions there. But just to let you know, Majda, we will have a pricing workshop at Tashkil, bit of a plug, uh, this spring season. Uh, so keep, we'll keep you posted on that. Follow us at Tashkil Studio. Any thoughts there? I mean, look, you're, you guys are the experts when it comes to artwork. And look, I'm... Uh, I'm I'm a consumer of those services, right? Because I have them in my projects. I, you know, push them on to my clients, et cetera. And for us, it's really, I'm sorry, but it has to go back to that emotional connection and that storytelling. So if you get those two right, you can pretty much price your art at whatever because you're telling a story through it. But I'll let you cover that with your pricing session. Wonderful. All right. Um... How, what about this? Uh, Virginia Tate, in early stages of growth and building a body of work, what is your perspe perce perspective on how selective to be with new opportunities and your thoughts on discounting to win work? Give me discount. You know, Virginia, that's a really good question. And I remember when I was starting out, you know, my husband's an economist and he said to me, you know, surely you will increase your payment terms and you will give them a lower price. And I just looked at him and I'm like, no, that's positioning me and my product very low 
my overheads were different. So obviously, you know, there are the Genslers and the Wilson Associates of the world who are much higher, like as a large scale operation, I couldn't charge those prices, but I never went in and undercut another kind of SME or a freelancer for two reasons. One was I didn't want to create enemies. The second reason was quite honestly, people really do equate price to quality. And you know, we are human at the end of the day. If I give you something for 10,000 dirhams, but it's actually worth 200,000 dirhams, you're not gonna take me seriously. So I would never go for the discounting strategy because this price to the bottom, this cannibalism, everybody loses out in the long run. You're not gonna make money. Your client's not gonna ever value or respect you. But being selective about new opportunities, I don't think when you're starting out, you can be selective. I did pretty much all the, projects unless the clients were not good people because that's that's a big thing for me people have to be good and only then I'll work with them but I pretty much did any type of project small big you know I it wasn't like can you just do a two-bedroom apartment I didn't walk away from it now I can but back then I was like sure you have a two-bedroom apartment you should have asked me sooner so yeah if there's trust go for it yeah uh, Safula says, align yourself with an extrovert. That's great advice, says Safula's mum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I throw in a question about working with local manufacturers? You talked about it at the beginning. Um, we at Tashkeel are, are built, continue to build our online platform MakeWorks UAE, uh, which shares information about local manufacturers willing to work with artists and designers and small and limited edition orders. What's your experience of working with local manufacturers and any advice to share with us? Yeah, listen, I'm a huge fan of social sustainability. If you look through my projects, you, it will be very hard for you to find a project that doesn't have a local artist in it. You know, I'll have, I pretty much have Khalid Shafar's work in every one of my projects, right? He's one of my favorite Emirati designers. But, you know, Al Jude's work, I'll bring in these kind of talents. My only challenge sometimes working with uh, younger local designers has been, you know, I'll find an amazing, and there was a very talented girl that I found, she did this beautiful chair. I found it, I was like, great, I need six pieces. They don't know how to convert that one prototype into six usable pieces with the fire life safety standards, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That's not their fault. I don't think we've provided them an ecosystem to help support translate that idea into a retail experience. That's my only challenge, scalability. And they always get their pricing wrong. No client is gonna pay 20,000 dirhams for a young artist chair, you know, when you can get a Vitra chair for 5,000 dirhams. So you have to be realistic about pricing. We hear you. Um, anybody else has got questions? All right. Oh, Yara Habib. Yara Habib, wonderful local designer. Thank you for the very insightful presentation. Do you recommend taking projects that pay little but bring exposure to your brand? Oh, we get this all the time. No, Yara, exposure doesn't pay my, my, my kids' school fees. I'm really sorry. You know, like I've had so many clients say to me, like, you know, we can't pay you, but I'll kind of push you on my channels and stuff. I was like, that's great. But I actually have to pay the school fees in hard cash, not on Instagram likes. So I would say no. Again, it depends. If you have a long-term relationship with them and it's a one-off thing and it's a small thing, it's not time consuming, maybe do it. But not like a one-year project where you're getting paid nothing just for exposure, no. We at Tashkeel also, when we receive any inquiries from companies or individuals offering uh, exposure instead of a fee, um, I turn into a Rottweiler, a charming Rottweiler nevertheless, but I tell them, no, you don't expect teachers to teach for free. You don't expect doctors to heal for free. So don't ask creatives to create for free. A question to Tashkeel for new starting artists. Do you have a list of recommended PR companies, website development companies, social media specialists offering services on limited budget? Uh, I am not Le Pajon, uh, but that is a really interesting question. Yes, if you join Tashkeel as a member, we can provide you with recommendations. We can guide you and you can become part of our community and learn along with others. Uh, Thank you so much. What was the name of the platform that Tashkeel just mentioned? Google, Make, 
works uae and it will take you to an online platform that is international uh, but if you click make works uae you will find a list of around 20 businesses across the uae who are willing to work with artists and designers on one-offs or limited editions uh, we've already assessed them and there's a little video and there's a taxonomy of their information as well more will be coming in the future finally well rawan hisham palavi says I'm an architecture fresh graduate, fresh graduate. Um, question about pricing your work, how you were able to price your work when you were a freelancer and how did you get projects or clients? Um, anything that you missed from previ answering previous questions, I guess. Yeah, Ravan, I think the one advice I would give you if you, if you take it is I would say, please get your 10,000 hours of expertise in before you start freelancing. The only reason I was able to understand pricing and doing freelancing is because I had done it. I had learned on someone else's dime while they were paying me a salary of how the industry works. It's very, you know, a lot of people get out of university and think, oh, I got this. I was like the most cocky, arrogant person at 22. But I think, get your 10,000 hours in, please try and get a job just to understand the industry first and then branch out if you, that, that, that would be my advice. Wonderful. All right. I think we've run out of questions, um, but thank you very, very much, Pallavi. You've certainly raised my spirits. I'm sure you've raised all the other people that are listening. Um, th this is the end of the January uh, Tashkil talk, but please uh, visit us online because every month we present a new speaker for free in our Tashkil talk series. So we'll see you in February when we'll be talking all things visual art. Pallavi Dean, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lisa. It was a pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.